Good evening. Thank you, Lacey. And I was going to say thank you to Father Ryan. Um, and also, I do want to congratulate Jennifer and Peter and all of you for this amazing organization. I know I, I just recently became acquainted with um, YCP, and uh, in one meeting with Jennifer and Peter, I immediately felt the calling from the Lord, and I wanted to do whatever I could to be a part of this amazing group. And so just know that my prayers are always with you. So um, when Jennifer and Peter actually asked me to present tonight, um, you know, I thought long and hard some of the ways that I've, you know, grown up in my life and how my faith has really been the main guide, everything I've done. And I thought about really presenting it from a business perspective. Um, but in thinking, again, um, I am going to do a presentation that's very personal. And it actually was really hard, really hard for me to prepare for tonight um, because of some of the events that have happened in my life recently. But I feel that, um, you know, it really is true to who I am and also true to where I am in my life. So um, I'm going to talk to you about my defining moments in my life and to give you um, an idea of how I have opened up my heart to receive God's grace. I'm also going to talk to you about the devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary and how she lights my path, reassuring me that I'm never alone, no matter what adversity I come to in my life. So, you know, in our lives, we make a lot of decisions. I have a few, a few slides that are big picture slides, so I'm not going to have any major words. You don't have to take notes or anything. <laughs> but, um, you know, every time we come across a decision, it's very difficult to think, you know, what job am I going to take? Where am I going to move? What is the next step that I need to take? What is the next promotion? And each decision leads us to a greater surrender to our Lord and to the knowledge that he already knows what is best for us. And in the next slide, I have my favorite scripture, Psalm 46.10, be still and know that I am God. I had this plaque all through my career in every office that I had, and it was interesting how I always had a lot of the admins would come in and say, can I borrow your, your, your plaque, be still and know I am God. I'm trying to be still, but I can't. And it's really hard, it's really hard to be still. Recognizing that the things that God has done in our lives and will continue to do. And I took this picture, it's really interesting, this cardinal was outside of my yard and allowed me to get really close and personal with it. And in looking at you know, how birds just sit for hours and are so still, and they're just you know, living creatures that God's put in, on the earth, and, and you know, how can we learn to be still and to know that no matter where our minds go, it is very hard to be patient. But my, my message to you tonight is that your faith needs to be authentic, both in your professional and your personal life. There is no difference. And there's no distinction. In order for you to receive the blessings that you have, that are going to be open to you, you have to be present. You have to be still, you have to pray, and you have to believe. And so I'm going to talk to you about a story of my life. I live with a deep sense that God has put everything in my path so that I can help others. I know that it is a great responsibility and that I must work very hard on myself. I search for meanings for all these events that have happened in my life and I see God sharing his light and his grace. My legacy is unfolding every day, and every day I am aware the decisions that I make are part of a much bigger purpose. My life has been marked with many changes. I was born in Cuba. I grew up in a small Cajun town in Louisiana, moved to New Orleans for high school. I studied to be a psychologist, and then changed my career to a systems engineer. Later, I went on to be sales and marketing. At one point, I even left the country to go find a kidnapped child. And then I worked for a major multinational company. And after 20 years or so in corporate America, I went on to consult with smaller companies. My personal life has been also completely impacted by change. 
I was married for 23 years and had three children. While in the midst of a very painful divorce, my son was diagnosed with mental illness. I suddenly became a single mom, dealing with twins in high school, a son who was in and out of mental hospitals, along with ailing parents, and the pressures of being an executive in corporate America. I was a breadwinner, the mother, and the caregiver. And once again, I found myself having to start over and learn new ways to provide for my family. Every day I engage in this process. I had to relearn how to manage my life, my family, my finances, and my career. Lessons that I had mastered years earlier were thrown out of the window. And I prayed for a better way to take care of myself, my children, my parents, and my employees. And my faith was the constant light that became brighter and stronger as I encountered more adversity. So you can change the slide. You can change it one more time, please. I was born in a town called Pedro Betancur in la provincia de Matanzas, Cuba. I didn't even know where it was for many, many, many years. My parents, younger brother, and I lived with my grandparents in a beautiful colonial town called Jovellanos. My father worked in the sugar industry, and my grandparents were in the cattle and rice industry. Life for my family was picture perfect. We lived among a large group of extended family, loving and supporting each other while enjoying the Cuban culture. But this would soon change, and in 1959, history happened, Fidel Castro took power, and he announced he was communist. The country became very divided. It was a time of fear, and as my mother recalls, these are things you see in a movie and you never thought they would happen to you. Yet there you are in real life, seeing the life you knew and the families you love go through unspeakable chaos and loss. And this was the time that my mother's devotion to our Blessed Virgin Mary grew more and her faith was strengthened. You see, the communist government began to crack down on the church and anyone who prayed was seen as defiant to the government. So my mother started a rosary group in the back of my grandfather's house and every night, the families came and quietly said the rosary because they knew that it was the Blessed Mother that would protect the families. And two years later, after the Bay of Pigs, my mother, brother, and I boarded the last Delta airline flight to fly out of Havana. It was November 23rd, and we landed in New Orleans on Thanksgiving Day, but we didn't know it was Thanksgiving Day. We faced sudden and extremely distressing loss of our homes, heart-wrenching relocation, and challenges of a new country. We moved into a housing project, and that is where Catholic Charities provided us with all of our pots and pans. My mom still uses their pans. We called it El Refugio, the refuge, a blessing for us that the Catholic Church would become our source of not only spiritual, but also physical support. They provided everything we needed, and hundreds and thousands of Cubans came. Their families were displaced, and they all found support in Catholic charities. It was difficult for me, being the oldest growing up in a small Cajun town in southern Louisiana. I was the only Hispanic in the school when I started first grade. And I can remember this defining moment. I call it my white dress day. It was the day when my teacher said it was pictures day, and I was so excited because I was not going to stand out in front of all these kids because I stood out, I didn't speak any English. And I went home and I told my mom I needed to wear a white dress. And she said, we don't have any, we don't, you don't have a white dress, we don't have any white fabric. And I said, I, I need a white dress, we need to go find one. So we went, my mother bought fabric, and she came home and sewed me a white dress, and I had white shoes and white socks. And I can remember driving into the schoolyard with my father and looking at all the children in the playground, and they were the color of the rainbow. And I thought, oh no, I have got this backwards. And I looked at my dad, and I said, you need to take me home because I'm sick and I'm not going to be in school today. And he said, no, you're going to stay, and you're going to get through this day, and you're going to get through many other harder days. 
And this is where you're going to learn that God's with you and that your faith is stronger than this because the Lord's God is here now and he's going to continue to take care of you. I have used this white dress day over and over again in corporate America and I'll tell you a funny story. I had a friend once that came to me at PepsiCo and she put together the story of the top 50 women in retail and, and so she said, I'm going to do the story, you're going to be part of it and we're going to talk about your white dress day. It's like, oh my gosh, no, you can't talk about my white dress day in this book or all these women. And so, you know, it was kind of like the first time that I really, really in corporate America came to connect with the white dress day. But it really is about finding your defining moments, your defining moments where you've had this amazing adversity and it was probably sometime in your childhood and really taking that moment and connecting with it and knowing that through your faith and through that adversity, you were able to move forward, and that gives you the strength and the courage to know that you can handle so many more things. I later attended a Catholic high school in New Orleans that allowed me to make friends and assimilate into a culture that provided the Catholic foundation that I would need to thrive for the rest of my life. There was no coincidence that I attended Cabrini High School which was founded and guided by the teachings of St. Francis Xavier Cabrini, the patron of immigrants. How would you know that? St. Francis Cabrini was actually the first American citizen to be canonized as a saint of the Roman Catholic Church. My faith has been tested over and over again. Every time it gets tested, I know it gets stronger. During very difficult events, I have experienced God's mercy. And what I want to talk to you today is how the Virgin Mary has been my companion and supported me in a very personal way. I can tell you so many events, but I've picked four events that are very personal to my life. And they provide a reassurance that you're not alone. So when my twins were born, they'll be 28 years this year. They were 28 weeks, three months premature. And I can remember the doctor telling me, your son Brian at three pounds and two ounces is gonna be fine. But your daughter Katie weighing only two pounds may not make it. And I can remember the heartache of calling my mother and father on the phone. We were here in Dallas and they were in New Orleans and telling her that they were born three months premature. And my mom's response was, today is December 8th, the Immaculate Conception, and the Blessed Mother will take care of them. And it's really interesting, as I prepared for today, and I was looking for a picture of the slide that I wanted to use to depict this, um, my daughter, Katie, is currently in the Holy Land. And at 6 o'clock this morning, she texted me this picture. And she said, Mom, I just visited the Church of the Annunciation where the angel Gabriel came down to the Virgin Mary to announce that she would conceive a son, Jesus. And I immediately knew which picture I was going to use for this. So there were no coincidence, absolutely no coincidence in our lives. So the next slide is, um, is also a miracle for me. It was a miraculous opportunity in 2012 when my mother and I were invited by my cousin, Bishop Felipe Estevez, to travel with the then Pope Benedict back to Cuba. The Pope was in Cuba to celebrate the anniversary of the appearance of La Virgen de la Caridad del Cobre, Our Lady of Charity. The legend, you can move to the next slide. The legend has it that for 400 years, Three fishermen were struggling with the stormy waters in the Caribbean. Fearing for their lives, they prayed to the Virgin Mary. The sky suddenly cleared, and when they did, the fishermen saw a wooden statue of the Virgin, completely dry and untouched by the storm. From that day on, the Virgin Mary was adopted as a protector of all Cubans. My family has a strong devotion to La Virgen de la Caridad. Through the war and revolution among the exiles and the communists, among the rich and the poor, Our Lady of Charity, whose feast day is September 8th, the same as the feast day of the Nativity of Mary, has stood by us 
no matter what difference. No matter what physical separation, she unites us and she is Cuba. It was a miracle for me to go back to Cuba decades later and to be able to take my mother. You can change the slide. So an interesting thing happened on this trip. I was asked, uh, we attended two, two masses, one in Havana in the Plaza of the Revolution and one in Santiago de Cuba. When we were pulling up to the Plaza of the Revolution, we were on buses with cardinals and bishops, and so one of the uh, bishops came to me and said, would you give out rosaries at, during the mass? And so I was there with my cousin, and so I, my mother had to actually travel in a wheelchair. Normally she doesn't do a wheelchair, but she had to because of all of the, the walking and everything. So they loaded us with bags and bags of rosaries. I was even putting rosaries like in my mother's wheelchair. And so I uh, went right to the front. I was right in front of then Pope De Benedict, in front of the um, newscasters, television newscasters, and I started to give rosaries to everyone and caused quite a scene. Everyone wanted a rosary. They were like jumping over people to get rosaries. It was like crazy hysteria. If you can imagine, the church had been shut down. They didn't have rosaries. I mean, rosaries were like one of the most precious things you can give someone. And I was actually stopped by the communist security guards and said, you have to stop giving out rosaries. But what happened was the cameramen would come across and they wanted rosaries. So I just kept giving everybody rosaries. And so um, it was really, it was an amazing, beautiful moment. There were hundreds of thousands of people there. And um, my mother, uh, when we left the Mass, because we were there for a week, we stayed in Cuba and visited with family. But one of the things that I was able to do was to take my mother back to her high school in Havana, Immaculate Conception. And she walked into the chapel that she had been you know, praying there for years and knelt at the statue of the Virgin Mary to give her thanks for helping her and you know, providing a safe journey for my mother to come back and to thank her personally for what she's given her. So it's very, very emotional. We uh, went back to my mother's house uh, where I was born, the church that I was baptized, the church that my mother was born in. And, uh, and my aunt was there and was able to give me my baby book with like a piece of my baby hair. So all this amazing, amazing moments that we shared so we're going back to the airport, ready to leave. And I have to tell you that one of the fears I've always had is going to Cuba and not being able to get out. It was always like in the back of my mind. And so as we go into the airport and I give my ticket, the lady behind the register says, do you have any rosaries? And I thought, oh, rosaries? I think I have some rosaries. So I you know, gave her a rosary. And then we went through security and went back into the gift shop. And there was a lady in the gift shop and she says, Oh, it's the rosary lady. You were on national television. Do you have more rosaries? I was thinking, oh no, I'm not going to be able to get out of Cuba. <laughs> and so uh, the good thing is that I was there with my cousin, the bishop, and all the cardinals are all lined up there. And, um, and we did have some extra rosaries. And, um, and the rosaries were, you know, uh, they were blessed by then Pope Benedict, and it was really so, I have to tell you, I have a show and tell, so the, I do have st two still left that I just treasure, so this is my little bag of my trip to Cuba with the rosaries, but I, I was called the rosary lady, so that was uh, my cousin, actually, uh, Bishop Estevez, I asked him, I said, do you think I could go back? He goes, I, I don't know about that, they have you on camera, <laughs> so I don't know if I'll ever be able to go back. So, um, two more things that I'd like to talk about. Um, and, you know, in closing, there are times when um, you go through great loss. There will be times in your life when you will go through great loss. And uh, this pain can be really unbearable. If you have not experienced um, the loss of someone in your life, there will be a time when you will. And I can tell you that the grace and um, you know just the support that you can have from the Virgin Mary is is really supernatural, and I'm I'm, I'm telling you that. So in June of 2012, 
um, right after uh, I went to Cuba, I actually was very fortunate. My daughter had finished college, uh, and, and we traveled to Fatima. And so my father at the time was in a nursing home in, in uh, Florida, and I was with my daughter and my brother lighting a candle at, at the shrine of Fatima, telling my daughter to really pray for the Virgin Mary um, because my father was, was ill. And what was so interesting is that we lit the candle, attended the Mass, and then we got back on the bus to take us to Lisbon, and I had my phone off. And so when I got back to my hotel and turned my phone on, my brother had called me 20 times or so to let me know that my dad had passed away, and he actually had passed away the same time that I had lit the candle in Fatima. So, you know, that's something that I, I really cherish. And yet the most difficult trial that to date that I have gone through is the loss of my son. And, um, and this is really hard for me to talk about, but I think it's also God's mercy and love that I'm doing it. And I have to tell you, he, um, I was remarried October 14th and I lost my son October 17th. And I'm so blessed today, his best friend is here. So Hunter, please stand. <laughs> there you are. Thank you. So, you know, you never know what's gonna happen in your life, but it was, seven, I call it the seven days of joy to sorrow, where one Saturday I'm celebrating my wedding with my family, and seven days later, I'm, so, I'm grieving my son at his funeral. And getting through this difficult journey has filled me with so much grace to be able to manage this untimely tragedy. There have been many signs of angels. And the one thing I want to talk about, which is the next slide, it's hard to see. But this is a really important message to me from the Virgin Mary. The night before my son passed away, we had come back and I was opening up wedding gifts. I have a brother who's an artist who had brought back a black and white picture from one of his earlier visits to Cuba 20 years before. He took this picture and blew it up on a canvas. And he decided that it was going to be a wedding gift for me. I didn't know. I, I opened it up on Monday night and, um, and didn't understand why he was giving me this picture. Now this picture is a picture of my father at the same age that my son was. And my father and my grandmother are carrying a statue of the Virgin of Charity, the patron of Cuba, through the, through the town of Hoayana, my hometown in, in Cuba. And the picture stayed with me all night. And when I got the call in the early mornings from the hospital saying my son had passed away, I knew why I had received that picture at that moment in my life. So I know without a shadow of a doubt that the Virgin Mary has always and is always by my side. I call to her and I've had her support through careers, through personal, through whatever tragedy and happiness I have had, I always lean on her. And the seeds of my faith have come from my family and what I've been through. I can tell you that there are no coincidences. You are exactly where you're supposed to be. And the journey is ongoing. And every hardship you face makes you stronger and brings you much closer to becoming the person that you're meant to be. The next slide is of my mom. She'll be 90 years old this June, and this was her 90th uh, birthday party. They did a, her church did a party for everyone who's turning 90 and above last weekend in Florida, so I went to it. And she always has a saying, and you know, I, when I was little, I used to say, well, I'm gonna go do this, I'm gonna go visit so-and-so, and she always says, si Dios quiere, and she'd cut me right in the middle of me saying, I'm gonna go to a meeting in whatever, New York, si Dios quiere. And, she, and I'm saying, why do you keep telling me that? I'm going to go no matter what. Si Dios quiere. So, you know, she really believes in her heart. The only way you're going to do something is if God wants. And so um, 
She's a constant reminder and a blessing. She says her rosary every day. She is, um, you know, really amazing. Her, her, her faith has been so strong, and I'm so blessed that at this time in my life, my 90-year-old mother is there to help me and to guide me through this, this, you know, difficult journey that I'm going through. So my message to you is to take heart, have courage, and open your life to receive the blessings that are bigger than you ever dream about because they're there and all you have to do is to believe and to be still. So thank you very much.